hundreds of thousands of years, humans have dwelt as cave dwellers, and suddenly, mysteriously, around 8,000 BC, we discovered civilization. Uh, it's an incredible anomaly that uh, historians are struggling with, and uh, the fact is that humanity's sudden development was itself the subject of an investigation commissioned by NASA, which pointed to a disturbing trend in evolved civilizations suddenly appearing completely developed about 10,000 years ago, and to technology and agriculture and science and mathematics and astronomy suddenly manifesting in places like Mesopotamia and Egypt and Yucatan, Peru, Japan and China. So the question is, was this a mass inspiration that humans had or did we inherit this from somebody else? Well, because at the same moment in time, there appear stories of unusual people possessing skills far and beyond the capacity of hunter gatherers. And they arrive in groups of seven, led by an eighth, a charismatic leader, and these groups kickstart civilization. So who were these gods and where did they come from? Well, to begin with, we're no strangers to lands lost to a flood 11,000 years ago. We talk about it all the time, and you know the names very well. Uh, Lemuria and Atlantis are always at the top of the list. But I always wondered, have we talked about these so much that we have actually forgotten that there were other land masses where the gods used to live? I think we've actually limited ourselves in our exploration of this topic. So how do land masses just disappear? That's the first question we've got to ask ourselves. Well, it turns out that we don't have to look very far to find these missing land masses. All you have to do is go back to 1789 in the middle of the Pacific. And I promise you that the rest of the presentation will not consist of these maps of Google with little pins on them. Um, 1789, the St. Vincent Islands were found between Baja and Tahiti. And there's actually a ship's account of 12 days spent there, which describes the islands providing a good harbor. They're moderately elevated, about 20 miles in circumference, well wooded and abounding with coconuts and fur seals. Well, the next captain to sail there 30 years later, spent 46 days surveying the, uh, the coordinates and found nothing but this colored water to a depth of 720 feet. In 30 years, all these islands vanished beneath the waves. And then there's the case of Davis Island, 500 miles southwest of South America, a land so large it stretched beyond the horizon and it was actually added to naval charts in 1687. Well, a Dutch captain sailing to Australia went looking for it 35 years after it was originally found, and he discovered, again, nothing. It was no longer above sea level. The name of this captain was Jacob Roggeveen, and don't feel too bad for him because he sailed on and he stumbled upon Easter Island by accident, the first Europeans to find this uh, very small island. And uh, two other islands were said to exist near Easter Island, and they even appeared on naval maps in 1912, and they too vanished within 20 years. Failed to be found by the US Navy, no less, after a three week fruitless search. So the point of this is that the Earth is an unstable, unpredictable and evolving planet. And you know what? So is our solar system. Because ancient astronomers were under no illusion that the orbits and velocities of planets are absolute. They are instead subject to change, and they forewarn future people of the Earth of the chaos that these variations bring upon our planet. One of them being the obliteration of all traces of former civilizations by meteorites. There is an account by an Egyptian priest that describes his uh, culture experience over 35,000 years. The Egyptians have been around much longer than we give them credit for, and they wrote everything down and gave the information to people who were visiting Egypt. And here it is what this priest told a visitor uh, about ooh, uh, two and a half thousand years ago. He said, and I quote, the change in the rising and the setting of the sun and the other heavenly bodies, how in those times they used to set in the quarter where they now rise and used to rise where they now set. At certain points, the earth revolves in the reverse direction and of all the changes which take place in the heavens, this reversal is the greatest and most complete. Now, that's quite a hell of a statement to make. 
um, this priest was talking to a Greek historian called Solon, who was visiting uh, the temple of Saïs back in the day. And he took the knowledge of all these past catastrophes back to Greece, and he shared them with a young man called Plato, who then goes on to write the story we know so well about Atlantis under a kind of a fictional uh, environment. He mythologized it. But it's a wonderful technique, mythology, because most people don't understand that mythology is a great way to impart important information wrapped in a theatrical device. That way, you will be bound to remember the story. And of course, we do. Now, one such event that the Egyptians were describing actually took place in 10,800 BC. The Earth was actually hit by a fragmented meteor, and uh, we have found many of the impact points today. And this is the event that led to the uh, last ice age called the Younger Dryas. And you've heard about this on social media and uh, videos uh, for the last, oh, God, uh, last decade at least. It seems to be an obsession at the moment. And ancient culture, cultures claim that this event is what reversed the Earth's rotation. Uh, even the Hopi described this event. The Younger Dryas lasted about 900 years before yet another meteor event happened in 9,700 BC. Uh, we're all whining about coronavirus today. You know what? Our predecessors were faced with bigger problems and they somehow survived. Well, this new event is what generated a global flood. And the tsunami are actually mentioned penetrating deep into Asia. In fact, the waves were claimed by the Tibetans to have reached uh, Tibet itself. That's over three miles high. That's some very, very big waves. If you look at the, some of the stories from the Pacific Northwest, the tribes there also describe the waves crossing the Cascades, the Olympics, and the Rocky Mountains. Uh, if we talk to the Shiglit and the Shokomish and the Yakima, and I hope you remember this because there'll be a test at the end, uh, they talk about how their canoes were flung atop uh, one mountain called Mount Jefferson. Now, Mount Jefferson is 10,000 feet high. So again, you can imagine uh, the, the scale of the event that these people faced. Now, where is the evidence for these incredible waves crossing the North American continent? Well, it's right in front of you. It's called the Great Salt Lake. Uh, the saltiness, it turns out, uh, is said to be uh, derived from mineral salts accumulating from the streams that flow into the Great Salt Lake. But there's a problem with this theory. The problem is that the salt in the Great Salt Lake is composed of sea salt. It had to be deposited there, not by rivers, but by uh, waves coming out of the Pacific and also probably from the north. And the change in salinity actually occurred about 10,000 years ago, which is roughly around the same time that the tsunamis from the flood overran the Rocky Mountains and the Central Plains. There are over 180 surviving flood myths around the world, and they all share identical details. They talk about large burning rocks falling from the sky, and they uh, fell in ocean areas, which then caused a global flood. And in Egypt, there's a book called The Building Texts in the Temple of Edfu, and they vividly describe a parallel pre-flood civilization whose architects were magicians. They had complete control of the forces of nature, and they're also capable of building enormous monuments with uh, as easily as you and I can stack two bricks together. And after the flood, their survivors reappeared at strategic locations, and I quote, to rebuild the former world of the gods. So many of the ancient structures that we see today are actually mirror copies of the world that they lost beneath the waves. And their handiwork is actually everywhere, if you care to look. Uh, here's a, a very rare photograph of, um, uh, on the cover of Science News from 1965, I believe it was. Uh, I, was I think I was four years old back then, and I still remember it. Um, this shows a, a row of stone columns. It's a photograph, and uh, the columns are said to bear inscriptions made by human hands. And you think, well, nothing unusual about that. Well. The problem is, is that they were found 55 miles off the coast of Peru, 6,000 feet below the present sea level. That's where the problem begins. These things are found in places where they shouldn't be. And of course, there are the examples above water as well. For example, megaliths that are completely out of proportion on tiny Pacific islands. And the Pacific is probably the best place to search for lost gods and their missing lands. Here's one place, 
A uh, few have ever heard of a people called the Waitaha. Well, it turns out that they are Easter Island's indigenous people, and uh, they carry a very important oral tradition that was only published recently. And they said that they lived on Easter Island, and I quote, when the stars shone in a different sky and a different pattern. In other words, they were there during a time when the processional cycle of the Earth moved, uh, had the stars uh, positioned in the sky in a completely different part of the sky. And they described their time in Easter Island as the lands and outer islands of Waitangi Kiraro, which is their name for Easter Island. So in other words, they lived on Easter Island when it was an archipelago. It was a group of islands, which of course it isn't today. Now, reading their, their accounts is an extraordinary adventure. Uh, they talk about how every year the Waitaha welcomed the appearance of the double hull canoe of the gods. And they called these gods the Urukeu. They were essentially, it means the people, the red people, or the people with red hair. And they describe these people as star walkers, long distance voyagers. And the Urukeu was said to travel regularly across the Pacific. But one year, the canoe failed to return when, and I quote, angry stars gathered close to the moon to give birth to the tides of chaos, the dreaded deluge. Now, that's a very important marker in the story because it places the accounts around 10,000 BC at the close of the Younger Dryas. Uh, like Aboriginal people in Australia, the Waitaha have a very long memory of events. The question is, where were, we, where were these Urukeu headed to? They were headed to a place called Aotearoa, otherwise known to you and I as New Zealand. And two generations after the world turned by water, which is their term, a descendant of these Urukeu, there was a female by the name of Hotu Matua, so just for once we have a female hero of the story, she arrives back on Easter Island after the flood consumed her original homeland. And together with seven sages, she was in charge of remapping the Pacific and all of its missing lands, which of course had now become islands. Well, the Urukeu were described as very tall, light-skinned, red-haired with green eyes, and sometimes blonde with blue eyes. And they also had beards. And on the picture on the left, you can still see the earliest Moai, the this, uh, description, well, the, the showing of a very nice little goatee. It's actually very stylish, and it goes all the way around the chin. Well, it turns out that it is their image that is depicted in the oldest Moai. And even the extended chins were designed to show and demonstrate that they had beards, which in many parts of the Pacific, it is impossible for men to actually have beards. Even Peru and certain parts of South America, men to this day cannot have beards. It's a, a physical impossibility. Now, these red-haired people uh, it gives you a bit of an understanding as to why they carved these big monoliths. And then they went to all the trouble of finding a very different type of stone uh, called the red scoria. And they carved it and placed these red cylinders on their head. And they said that it's to depict their hair color. And I find the story very compelling because it would have been much easier to carve these hats out of the same stone in one go rather than going looking through uh, red volcanic rock around Easter Island, carving it and then putting it on top of the heads of these sometimes 42 foot tall structures. So although the White Tower account is over 11,000 years old, there is actually no mention of erecting the Moai. They are already an established fact, which leads us now to the speculation that they are much older than accounted for. They, the current uh, philosophy, the orthodox philosophy, is that they're only about 800 years old, uh, which anybody in the Pacific just completely laughs at. And uh, there's some new evidence to suggest that uh, in the carbon-14 record, that they're actually far, far older than, than, than they are, they've been uh, assumed to be. Well, let's move the story a little bit forward. After the world turned by water, the grandchildren of the gods, they set sail from Easter Island back to New Zealand to locate the birthplace of the gods. And there it is on that little yellow dot on the South Island. And it is here that we find three sites which are described by the Dalai Lama himself as the spiritual center of the universe. Not the earth, but the universe. And that's quite a big claim. 
And here is the center of those three sites. This is called Tekohanga, which means the sacred nest or the crucible of the world. So you, what you're looking at here is the birthplace of the gods, according to the Waiha tradition. And having been there six times now, I can't get enough of this place. I, it's a place I absolutely adore and have researched and walked uh, myself many, many times. If you look carefully, it looks like a, a primordial mound. And uh, it was once actually surrounded by a glacial lake. You can still see the area where the water used to, uh, the, where the water level used to be right up to its base. So it very much resembles the kind of mound that rises out of the waters of chaos in so many traditions. And if you were to stand in the middle of this, um, this mound, you would look across uh, back to where I'm taking the picture to the second location, which is this. This is Kura Tauhiti from where I've just taken the picture on top of the hill. And it means distant school. And each stone along this ridge is set to hold the entire wisdom of the Urukeu. In other words, it is an outdoor academy. And the, uh, the information was said to have been carved into the stones by a group of people called the Keepers of the Stone, for which the Waitaha have a wonderful description. These people were able to shape stone without breaking its spirit. What a wonderful description. And in fact, if you read the... Um, the story in the uh, the White Heart narrative, they said, huge are the sacred monuments we carved at Te Kohanga. And I'm not surprised. The first time I ever went there without actually realizing this story was even available, it never uh, occur occurred to me that these were natural eroded uh, uh, stones, which resemble uh, features like a face, as the one you're seeing right now, and animals and so forth. Uh, that does exist in nature. I always assumed these to have been the remains, the weathered remains of previously carved images. And I was proved correct when I read their account about a year later. Well, the most prominent monument is of their tutelary goddess and her name is Marotini. And here she is in all her glory. Uh, it's a big stone. It looks like a, an eroded sphinx, doesn't it? You can still see the eye sockets, the mouth. And of course, it's very eroded after at least 10,000 years of, uh, of rain. Uh, let me describe to you what uh, they wrote about this particular stone. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. A towering column of the purest stone was shaped to place Marotini on the land. We are so much of the stone shapers when they cast her to stand against the stars. Tall timbers and thick ropes lifted them high above the land to carve Marotini. Ever higher they climbed to cut away the curving charcoal lines to reveal the beauty of our ancestor beautiful place. Well, when might the birthplace of the gods be established? Uh, because this is my particular area of expertise, finding out the age of things. Well, if the Urukeu were navigating the Pacific before the flood, they could have been in New Zealand before 10,000 BC. So that's a basic logic. Well, Waitaha describe a calendar stone in this valley. Well, if we could find that calendar stone, it will help tremendously the dating of the actual site. Well, years of search continued. Uh, I walked uh, along this valley for six years, like I said, nothing resembling a calendar stone ever popped up. And then I decided to, uh, on my last trip to focus on a third site, which few people know about, and it's rarely visited, and it's called Flock Hill. And um, uh, there are hundreds and hundreds of eroded limestone outcrops, and they're all natural, but some of them are suspiciously unusual. They don't behave like uh, eroded limestone outcrops. And um, I was, uh, remember the, uh, just walking around after about an hour, wondering, you know, what the hell am I doing on this ridge? And I figured, what exactly am I looking for? When the only bird, and I mean the only bird in the entire valley, a falcon no less, lands on this rock. Now, if I was an ancient Egyptian, I would have thought, thank you, Horace, uh, why are you sitting on this very large monolith? Well, it turns out that on close inspection, it does actually look like a hand-carved monument, which is now very eroded. Uh, here's a close-up of it, which shows that it's a disc with a, a, a sundial. It actually looks like a sundial with what looks like two eyes and nose and a mouth. Uh, it's barely perceived today, and you can, you know, uh, Water does not behave like this. Uh, this is definitely something that's been eroded for a very, very long time. And yet, uh, the protrusions on that uh, little knob are still quite definite. 
Uh, is it possible that I'm making this up? Well, let's, let's take a look at this. Let's, uh, first of all, in order to understand the dating of things, uh, what are we looking for? Because it could be the sunrise, it could be the sunset, it could be the moon, it could be a constellation. Well, now you have to look into the mythology of the White Heart. And their prime constellations, their principal points in the sky are Orion and the Southern Cross. So using the art of archaeoastronomy, we can now roll the sky back in time and find out, is there a relationship between the orientation of the stone and the sky at some particularly uh, remote time? Well, the first sighting of the Southern Cross when it appears above the stone is on the spring equinox of, of 14,800 BC which means, if correct, the Urukeyu were here before the first of the three ice ages, which is the oldest, driest event. Now, I, uh, I, I posit that this perhaps is a bit too old for some people to appreciate, and I, I myself, I'm, I'm even a little skeptical about this. Uh, could people have been in New Zealand at that remote period? We simply don't know. So I began to look at the second possibility, which is Orion. Now, things really began to happen here. Because the first time you see the belt of Orion above that little knob is again on the spring equinox of 10,800 BC. And it's exactly the period of the meteorite impacts that started the Younger Dryas. So the question is, did the Urukeyu move here after the event and they began this birthplace of the gods or were they already here before the event? Well. The other question is, when does the entire constellation appear for the first time about this calendar stone? It appears again on the spring equinox in 10,400 BC. And at the very same moment that you are looking at this, if you go to the other side of the valley and you go back to Kudatau Hiti, well, Marotini is gazing at the Southern Cross and the Milky Way rising vertically at the same moment. So that's a dual reference offering a high probability that the Urukeu were indeed commemorating this date at the birthplace of the gods. Now, any of you who are familiar with this uh, ancient system of knowledge, you may find this date a little bit familiar. Where have we seen this sky, ground, and date correlation? Well, we have found it at Teotihuacan and the three pyramids that mirror Orion's belt, and of course, Robert Beauval and Adrian Gilbert's uh, calculation for the Giza Plateau. So there are overlapping relationships between the flood gods of Egypt and the Urukeu as well. So it's not just the monuments, it's the people who erected these sites on two opposite sides of the planet. And I'll come back to this later to keep this a little bit sane and somehow memorable. Let's return to the white hard narrative while I try to squeeze in a cup of coffee around here. Oh, yes. Well, when the Urukei returned from New Zealand, they would have to bypass Easter Island to visit Kainga Nui Nui, which means the great land in the east, the place of ancestors where they were already established. Well, where is Kainga Nui Nui? Well, there are two possibilities. One, there's a missing land of gods that's now sunk between Easter Island and South America. And there is a substantial evidence to back this up from, again, the missing lands that we found only in the 18th century, and also from the stories of people in the Pacific as well. However, if you take a second possibility, there is part of the story of the Urukeu and the White Heart talk about how that when they made this voyage from New Zealand to this missing land, they took two totem birds with them. And one woman was named Titi and one was named Kaka. And together, they form a name, Titicaca, which is the home of the temple city of Tiwanaku. And here we are. Uh, the etymology of Tiwanaku reveals information uh, about its origin and purpose. For example, uh, it's not a modern word. Tiwanaku is actually an Aymara word, which means you have to understand Aymara. And it's actually, a uh, when you put it into Aymara, it's actually Tewanaku and it means my people, okay, or the city of my people. Except there's a problem here because the syllable Aku is not Aymara, it is Egyptian, and it means shining being. So Tiwan Aku is best described as the city of my shining beings or my shining people. But what makes this city an antediluvian site? Well, <clears throat> 
excavations of the uh, nearby temple of the uh, called Kala Sasaya, which is essentially this massive, massive quadrangle of upright monoliths. Before it was filled in with earth, by the way, because if you've been there, half of this stuff does now exist. This is how it was actually found excavated about 120 years ago. And that this quadrangle was found to be offset from the horizon, excuse me, from the horizon stars by 18 degrees, because in the time it was built and the time that it was measured, the earth and its background of stars have moved. The, all the stars have shifted, so the temple and the horizon no longer adds up. So when the calculation was done and, and uh, it was found that the stones actually correlated to the horizon in 15,000 BC. So this makes Tiwataku and Kalasasaya one of the oldest temple cities on earth. And the results were actually validated by five mathematicians at the time. But even so, the Kala Sasai itself appears to have been forced to fit an existing layout. And here it is. Um, the adjacent temples to the Kala Sasai are actually slanted by three degrees. There is the semi subterranean temple, there is the Akapana Mound, and also just down the road, another site called Puma Pumku. Um, the fact is that these are found on deeper sediment, which means that they are even older than the Kalasasaya itself. And with that three degree deviation from the Kalasasaya, it means that these sites are not only older, they're also referencing the Earth's meridian in a much earlier era. Well, here's a bit of mathematics for you. It takes the Earth's axis 21,600 years to tilt three degrees. And that means it places these earliest of temples around 36,000 BC. Is this too early for a, a civilization to be up in the Andes? Well, consider for one thing that the start of the Egyptian king list in the Turin Papyrus is dated between 36 to 39,000 BC. So there is a historic precedent for the establishment of civilization in the Egyptian chronicles, which can be correlated to the uh, Andean plateau. And the observation also shows that there were three building periods at Tiwanaku. There was a first period, which is very, very remote. There was a second building period, uh, which is clearly seen by the shape and size of the stones, which took place about 15,000 BC, which shows destruction by a massive flood overwhelming the area. In other words, Lake Titicaca literally tipped on its axis and the entire contents of the lake flowed towards the temple. Uh, it, dumped, it dumped people, animals, uh, cooking utensils, all in this terrible conflagration. And then there's a third period of building around there, which is the reconstruction of the temple, followed many thousands of years later by the Inca people, who actually built very little. They inherited very much. So was it the Urukeu who returned to Titicaca to rebuild these sites, we wonder? Well, the Ayamara and the Pukina, uh, which are even older people uh, than the Ayamara, they are said to have fled to the Andes when the flood sank their island continent in the Pacific called La Pukije. And the local people said it's, uh, they, the nickname of this uh, missing land in the Pacific was called Mu'ul, which of course becomes known as Lemuria. And that's still taught in the local schools around Lady Dikaga, by the way. They're very proud of their heritage. And they said that the temples were rebuilt by a god man called Vidakosha and seven craftspeople. And these cross people were called the Hai Hai Wapanti. Uh, when you ask uh, the Aymara what does this word mean, they said it means shining ones. And that's the name that was given to Tiwanaku. Well, if you look carefully at the statue of Vidakosha, which is portrayed here in, in red scoria in Tiwanaku, by the way, the same stone that's used for the hats of the Moai on Easter Island, you see a snake on the side of the statue. And that was a symbol of office. And that symbol was called the people of the serpent. So that's their, that was their symbol, their, character, their characteristic emblem. Well, what more do we know about these people of the serpent? Well, the high high Wapanti was said to be very tall, light skinned, red haired, and they had beards, which is very rare in the Andes, like I said. And um, the, uh, like the Urukeu, they too had red hair. And they also had elongated skulls, which is not the result of uh, 
cranial deformation by the mothers, which is something that came later because they wanted the children to be born to look like the gods. And believe me, when you see deformed cra uh, craniums, they look stupid. They look like cone heads. But these are not. These are very elegant. And also, these skulls have a 25% larger cranial capacity than human skulls. Now, you can reshape your skull, but you can't increase its cranial capacity. It's genetically impossible. So the, uh, these are a, a natural group of people which are, who are very different to, uh, to us. In fact, the, um, the stories from around the world describe these gods as human-like, but not quite human. And uh, the local people were not afraid of these uh, tall people. They were very happy with them. Uh, the problem came with their children, which is a completely different story. Now, the DNA of these uh, skulls also tracks that, uh, them to a region of the Black Sea, Mesopotamia, and also, surprise, surprise, to Egypt. So now the question is, might the Urukeu and Virakosha and his shining ones be of Egyptian origin? 